Well, where were we? I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to do this. There's way too much left to tell you. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is just do something very impressionistic. No details. Just when you go to read the books, uh, I want you to, to be, what are the things to be looking for? Like, what, what are the big ideas? Okay. So, so, so let's try to get some big ideas. So, you go to watch YouTube? Uh, sure. Sure. Although, I don't know that there are YouTube. Are there YouTube videos about this topic? I don't know. At a research level, for sure. Uh, I don't know if there are you know, pedagogical like. Oh, great. Where they go into the details, where they actually give you the guts, or they just sort of say and. Well. I, I haven't sort of went in depth, so I okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. If you find some, send them to me because I'd be curious to see how, you know, the, the, this really is something that most people study on their own by reading a book because the definition itself is two pages long, where you, you know, talk about GK modules and finite, you know, K finiteness and uh, universal developing algebra finiteness and, and then. Course like that is very important because it's like, Takes you not just one video or two videos. Sure. It like takes you all like very far and you can branch in different directions and understand yeah. the connections. Yeah, my guess is you uh well, okay, maybe we can talk afterwards about how how to design such a course so that on the last day you're not still trying to get to the definition of the of the core object. But um we, I mean, we took a few detours of the over the. If, if someone already knows the classical theory, then then sure you can do that. And so basically, in two semesters, I think you could you could cover. Anyway, okay. So I don't know. Um, what did we discuss last time? We talked about the the uh, Lie algebra, right? The Lie algebra. Let's stick for at least a little while to G of G, which is S L two R. Of course, we're using GL2R and we're using the Adels and so on. We talked about the universal enveloping algebra. These are differential operators. These are all order differential operators, uh, all order uh, differential operators, not just linear. Uh, we have the lead bracket. We looked at the center. This is the center. And the important thing about the center is that it it commutes yes well okay it, it commutes yes it commutes with the differential operator commutes also it's in invariant this is the center which is the, uh has the invariant differential operators invariant different in for invariant under the group action differential operators differential operators uh so commutes not just with uh the other differential operators by definition of the center, but it commutes with the group action, with the regular representation. Regular representation, both left and right. Okay, and um, we talked a little bit about K types. So we said that F uh, has, let's say, K type. Um, people always use little k like weight k. But if I'm talking about k and little k, let me, let me, maybe it's blasphemous to use a different letter for this purpose, but let me use L. Um, F has k type L if um, F of G k theta is e to the two pi i or whatever, yeah, let's say two pi i L theta F of G for all G in G and k theta in k. k is, is SO2, right? We saw this, we saw, oh yes, the center, the center is generated by, generated by the Casimir element. In this case, there's, it's just one Casimir element. Um, and the Casimir, uh, the Casimir restricted, to functions with k type zero, restricted to k invariant functions 
G mod K, or maybe better to say restricted to L2 of, well, G uh, mod gamma, but there's no, there's no gamma yet, in which case I don't want to say L2. Yeah, let's just say restricted to functions that are invariant under K is the Laplacian. Right. This is a second order differential operator. This is a second order order operator invariant under all un, invariant under the group action uh, invariant operator. And when you restrict to k type zero functions that are in that are invariant under k, uh, you get the Laplace, the hyperbolic Laplace, negative y squared. Two derivatives in x, two derivatives in y. In the in the, um, I mean, I have to tell you a coordinate system. The coordinate system is uh, the n a k for for f n x a y k theta coordinates. Right. We discussed this. Um. Good, we saw that the R's and L's, yeah, so R, I mean, I'm lying a little bit. I'm gonna be lying a lot. Maybe I should put an asterisk here. Everything I'm saying is, is a slight lie. Uh, this, um, what you what you really need to do to get the, the true raising and lowering operators is to uh, conjugate this. So, um, uh, or conjugate thereof, you need the uh, adjoint conjugate there of uh, in the complexified Lie algebra. So uh, yeah, you just, uh, the complexified Lie algebra of SL2R is SL2C. I wanna be able to have complex entries here. Um, what's the uh, complexification of, of the Lie algebra of SL2C? It's not itself. I would think that it would be itself. But it's not itself. It doesn't have a name. What? It's just yeah. So SL two C is a six dimensional real manifold, which has a complexification to uh, twelve dimensional uh, as a real uh, Lie Lie vector space. Plus I plus a different I from the I of the C times SL two C. Yeah. Um, so R and L. Uh, act or conjugates thereof act as mass raising and lowering operators. We discussed this, I think, yeah. raising and lowering operators. So, uh, um, yeah, I guess this, so C in NAK coordinates, in NAK coordinates, uh, is the operator negative y squared two derivatives in x plus two derivatives in y uh, plus y a single derivative in y times a derivative in theta if I recall I think that's right which is what it, which is what gives this formula the r and the l um, l is something like in these same coordinates, these are linear operators. R and L are themselves linear operators. It's something like um, Z minus Z bar times D Z bar um, plus uh, Y D D theta. Do I have this written down somewhere? Yeah, I think it's just D D theta. Okay, so don't quote me on this. It's something like that. And so if you, uh, if you restrict, if L is restricted to uh, L isotypic, well, the K, K type, K type L, in other words, a function that, uh, that has this uh, property, that when I differentiate with respect to theta, all that comes down is uh, an L, is an L. 2 pi L. Uh, if L is restricted to that, I get negative Z minus Z bar, DZ bar plus L. 
2 pi i l. Uh, I'll just write l since everything is wrong anyway. Okay. So what's the big idea? I think I said everything that um, that we discussed. Oh yeah, and and, uh, and L um, R takes functions with K type L, K type L to K type uh, L plus two. That's what makes it a raising operator. If if uh, a function has that uh, has this property, then i.e. okay, let me just say if f of g k theta is e to the i l theta f of g. And you see, I'm even dropping the, whether I want the two pi there or not. Um, then, roughly speaking, R f of g k theta is e to the i theta l plus two f of g. And similarly with similarly with l, where l goes to l minus two. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, that's everything that I that I wanted to say. Okay, so here's the big big idea. And everything everything is rough. rough here. Here's the big idea. This is so Gil, as I think I mentioned, Gilfan was sort of was here uh, for the latter uh, part of his career. Um, so Gilfan Grave and Pietesky Shapiro, Grave and Pietesky Shapiro. Uh, this is one person. This is one person. This is one person. So there's there should be a hyphen here, but if I put a hyphen, it looks like poor people. So I won't. I'll pretend there's no hyphen. I don't know. Okay, whatever. Um, so Gilfan was saying everything should be algebra. You wanted everything to be algebra. Uh, you want to do differential geometry is algebra. It's Lie algebras. If you want to do um, dynamics, the geodesic flow is algebra. It's just the diagonal multiplying by diagonal matrices. And uh, if you want to understand MOS forms, again, it should be algebra. So how is it algebra? The big idea is uh, to lift. So we're going to lift um, a MOS form. Let's start with a MOS form. MOS form for SL2Z, for a congruence group. Let's just stick to SL2Z. Lift um, uh, from a MOS form to phi uh, on a function. So this is SL2Z. So SL2R mod SL2Z mod SO2, right? That's what it means. This is the upper half plane. So a MOS form for SL2Z is a function on this on the upper half plane that has this quotient. We're going to lift F to a function phi on SL2R mod SL2Z. And then we'll lift that, lift phi to a whole vector space, V phi, which will be a uh, infinite dimensional, infinite dimensional vector space. With a G action uh, that's irreducible under the G action. And how do you do this? Well, it's the it's the like you could you should tell me how to do this because it's the only thing you could possibly do. So you have a function f. F takes things in the upper half plane and gives you complex numbers. F is invariant under SL2Z. How do I? So how to lift, how to lift to G. So I want to have a function phi that lives on G, G, in fact, G mod gamma. So it should take G and map it to uh, it, it's going to go to a complex number. But what should I, I, I give you a two by two matrix. I know what to do with el, with elements in the upper half plane. Okay. Take its integer under the kosher map and send it there. Exactly. So it's just F of G times I. Right? G times I 
is in the upper half plane. F takes values there. If I replace G by some multiple of gamma, that multiple of gamma goes there and F is invariant, which is equal to F of G gamma. So this is invariant on the code. We've done nothing. Okay. Uh, what, what if it was a modular form? If modular, if F is modular of weight, modular of weight, well, I'll go back to using K. K, then how do you construct such a phi? You take G to, Same thing, but it won't be invariant. So uh, f of z, remember f of z times y to the k over two has the has the uh, has the good yeah, automorphic properties. So so what I want to do is take imaginary part of g i to the k over two. This is still a complex number, right? So that's Either way, we get we get functions on this quotient. And it exactly uh, moves around by, by what it's supposed to. Okay, so now given the function, so this is just an aside. Uh, this all is an aside. So now you have this function phi. What do you do to come up with an infinite dimensional vector space that will be irreducible under the G action? So I want it, I've, I've uh, L2, so this, this function phi is in L2 of G mod gamma. It's in L2 because uh, F was in L2, right? This is a cusp form, mass cusp form. We're in L2, this is a function in L2. I wanna decompose this into irreducibles in such a way that phi is one of those is, is in that irreducible vector space. Why don't I take phi and I move it by uh, G. And I do that and I take the span over all G and G of these functions, right? I have a vector, I start moving it by the group and I take this the span, I'll see linear combinations of all of all things that are translations, G translates of, of phi. That's an infinite dimensional vector space. I do the G acting itself to G gamma. Uh yes. So pi, uh sorry, pi G phi evaluated at H is phi of H times G. So it's the right regular representation. So that if I have a if I replace h by gamma h, that gamma still hits the left side of phi where phi is invariant. Okay, so this takes, this maps L2 of g mod gamma to itself. And I take a single vector, I take the span under the g action of that one vector. I have no other choice but to get an irreducible subspace. Now, <laughs> bless you. Now this space uh, seems like it's, Crazy! How are you going to get your hands on this on this thing, right? So this is a this is an irreducible. So pi comma v phi is an irreducible g representation. G is SL two r. Because I took a single vector. You take a single vector and you just act by g on it, and you see where you where you can get to. So how can you have another subspace? Yeah, okay, there's one more thing I have to say. So the fact, if I took a random vector, of course, that would not be the case. Um, the fact that this commutes with Casimir. So remember, uh, Casimir of phi, uh, how do I wanna say this? Yeah, I wanna say it right here, in fact. Uh, Casimir of phi is 
well, phi is a function on it. Phi, this phi is a function that actually is invariant. Phi is in L2 of G mod gamma, that's K invariant because you put a K on the right, it's hitting I. And so C of phi is just uh, delta of F, uh, which is uh, some eigenvalue times F, which I'm lifting to phi. Let's put this in parentheses. Again, this is all very impressionistic because I'm trying to avoid technicalities so that I can actually say something by the end. Um, okay. And uh, C is invariant. And so if I look at any of these pi G fees, uh, I take C of that, take the Casimir of that, and uh, the Casimir can trade places. So it's pi G of C phi, and that's lambda pi G of phi. So in fact, all of these things are eigenfunctions of the Casimir with the same eigenvalue. Okay. Um, and uh, well, so you have Shor's lemma that if you have an irreducible representation, then something, this, I'm sort of going backwards. If you have an irreducible representation, uh, that's a G representation. So anything, uh, any phi that's in the vector space, if you apply pi G, you'll also be in the vector space. So C uh, fixes that representation, intertwines with that representation. And Shor's lemma tells us, so going in the other direction, conversely, conversely, if pi V is an irreducible, irreducible G representation, then uh, C acts on V. And so uh, Shor's lemma tells us that C acts by, by scalars. Acts by scalars. Now, if I have this vector space, uh, if there exists uh, some vector phi in V that's K invariant, okay? If this is called spherical, uh, then uh, V is called spherical. So if I have a spherical representation, Right, this means that phi of um, pi k phi, let's, let's use this language, pi k phi is phi for all k and k, which is the same thing as what we were, this is just another way of saying phi of g uh, k theta is equal to phi of g. It's invariant under k. So if you have a, uh, a function phi in here, C acts by scalars. So C phi is some lambda multiplying by, by phi. But C on the K invariant functions is the Laplacian. That implies that phi is a, an eigenfunction of the Laplacian. If this, if this V is a, is a sub, uh, vector space of L2 of G mod gamma, then phi is a mass form for gamma. You see how this goes, goes in both directions? So if you have an irreducible representa representation, uh, the fact that you have an invariant differential operator that commutes with a regular representation, means that it acts by scalars. And if you have a spherical vector, you might not, they're, they're uh, non-spherical representations, but if you have a, a spherical vector, uh, then it, it then this representation must come from mass forms exactly this way. Now, okay, this this looks like a scary thing, but actually it's uh, it's something much simpler. You can take, 
um, can take any, uh, what should I call this, V, V in V, in this big V, the span, the span of the, uh, V is the span, G, and uh, take, ex expand, this is the re restriction of G to the maximal compact. In this case, it's just take Fourier transform. Take Fourier transform in K, i.e. we write V. So you write V of N uh, A K. K is a circle. In general, K is compact. So we can look at the representations of K, but the representation of the circle are just the integers, is indexed by the integers. So if we decompose this, this is equal to uh, a sum of some coefficients, um, let's call it L, from coefficients times uh, a function, let's call it VL of N, X, A, Y, K theta, where VL of N, X, A, Y, K theta is equal to, or in general, VL of G, K theta, G k theta is uh, e to the two pi i l theta times v l of g. In other words, we've broken v into the l k isotopic components, i.e., v is broken into k, big K meaning the group isotopic. Isotopic means they all have the same type isotopic components, VL, these, these are them. So, so what's going on is really, really simple. This, I'm, I'm think I'm making this uh, very complicated. You start with your feet, okay? Phi is here, looks like your feet, there you go. Phi is in V and V has a grading by um, the KA significant components. So we're just splitting into those vectors, but what are those vectors? So at K, at L equals zero, K type, the thing that are, uh, that are K invariants, you just have phi itself. Then for every even, because this is really PSL2, uh, you only get the even Ls uh, occurring. So when L is equal to two, L is equal to four and so on. Do we know something? Do we know a vector that will transform with K type two? Take the raising operator, exactly. R phi and then R squared phi and so on all the way up. And then we, we can also go in the negative direction. L is minus two, L is minus four. So this is L phi, L squared phi. So this big, scary, infinite dimensional representation, this span of phi is nothing but a sum of R to the N phi or the, the span, I mean, it's spanned by R to the N phi where, where N is in Z and, I'm, and if R is raised to a negative power, that means use L to that power. Okay, so you get from a single function. So we went from F, which was on H. We trivially lifted it to a function on G. Then you apply all the raising and lowering operators to that function. And that spans this big infinite dimensional vector space. And you can go backwards. If you have one of these irreducible infinite dimensional vector spaces, you take the K fixed part. That gives you a mass point. Okay, and there's a theorem that uh, the, the spherical, uh, if you have an irreducible representation, the spherical uh, space, subspace is at most one dimension. It might be zero dimensional, but it's at most one dimension if it's irreducible. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, what happens for modular forms? Uh, if 
f was a modular form, then phi was this y to the k over 2 f of z, well, uh, to g, lifted to g, with z replaced by g i. Uh, this thing is not k fixed. And we can apply raising and lowering operators. So when we get this v phi, I don't know why I keep writing theta. This, this v phi looks like this. Um, there's nothing at L equals zero. And there's nothing at L equals two. And so on until you get to L equals K. L equals K is this, is this phi. And then you have the raising operators at phi, moving it up. But what happens if you apply a lowering operator? The lowering operator of phi, well, there's nothing at uh, th this, this, there is no, the K minus two isotopic component is empty. So what happens to L phi? It is zero, L phi is zero. But remember what L was. L was this, L was this right here. Again, everything I'm saying is very crude and, and uh, should be taken with a big grain of salt, but I'm just trying to give you hints of what, uh, what you'll see when you read these parts of the book that, that we're, uh, so, so L, at, now we're at, we're at little L equals K. So this is gonna be something like K, or it's really K over two. Uh, everything is wrong, everything is wrong, okay? Everything's wrong. But when you apply L to this product, it turns out that L of phi vanishing is equivalent to D, D, Z bar of F vanishing. This constant K is killed off by, by the action of, of uh, this differential operator on the product and, it, and there's a chain rule. So what does that mean? It means homomorphic. Yes. So if you find a, a lowest weight uh, vector, so this k is the is the lowest weight vector, or if it's down here, at, at, uh, if it's anti-holomorphic, there's also uh, phi uh, and the lowering uh, of phi. There's like there's nothing in a band from minus k to k, and then there's a lowest weight vector and then or a highest weight vector. So this is the lowest weight vector, and this is a, this is called it. It's still irreducible. No, no, no. Uh, you can have one or the other if you have you take anti-holomorphic functions. Yeah. So this is the lowest weight vector. Uh, this this uh, representation will be a discrete series representation. So if you have this irreducible v phi, you have a lowest weight vector, meaning that when you apply a lowering operator to it, it, it it's annihilated. And that lowest weight vector will correspond to a holomorphic modular form. So again, you have, there's a lot that has to be done to make any of this precise, but I'm trying to give you an impressionistic view of what the future, what, what the rest of these, uh, uh, what the rest of the story is. So this is to me really beautiful. I, I hope uh, despite the fact, despite the imprecision, I hope the, what's going on is, is coming across. You start with your function, uh, with your modular form, F, it's just a, 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 a MOS form, a MOS form on the upper half plane. You lift it to a function on G, okay, that's just trivial. That's just the correspondence between G mod K and H. But then you apply the group action. And what you'll get is something that is, that is spanned by phi and all of its raising and lowering operators all, at all weights. And, and you can go backwards. If you have an irreducible representation, you look at the k-fix vector. If you find one, well, the Laplacian uh, commutes with all of these differential operators and it commutes with the, um, I thought I had another picture here. Oh yeah, these are my two pictures. 
uh, the Laplacian commutes with uh, with translation with the regular representation, and uh, being irreducible by Shor's lemma tells you that the Casimir operator acts as scalars, and so you get a you get a mass form. And going the other way, uh, and for for modular forms, you have a similar picture, except now instead of looking at the k fixed vector, you look at the lowest weight vector, the lowest k type, which has a non-trivial uh, k isotopic vector. And the fact that L of that has to vanish, you can't go any lower without get, without hitting zero. So L of that vanishes when you unwind the, the product rule uh, from, from what the L operator is, you find that it's, it's the Cauchy-Riemann equation. So both the Cauchy-Riemann equation and the Laplacian are sitting in, in the same place from the point of view of representation theory, from these differential operators, the linear differential operators of raising and lowering operators and the quadratic differential operator of the Casimir, which is the, which generates the center of the universal enveloping operator. Okay. Yes, for both cases. So he was saying people were only, people were seeing these two phenomena. They were seeing holomorphic forms that has one behavior. They were seeing mass forms that has a completely different behavior. He's like, no, no, they're the same thing. They're just different representations. Different types of these are discrete. These are called discrete series representations. Ones that have this lowest weight vector. Well, the ones. Okay, um, I'm not going to get into the complete classification of the irreducible representations of SL2R, which we do have. So let me let me point out in the 40s, uh, 46, 47, something like this. 47. Uh, Bargman, uh, physicist here in the in the U.S. and independently, Gelfand, uh, and uh, Neu Neumark, Neumark, uh, Gelfand and Neumark gave complete classification, gave a complete classification, classification of irreducible representations of SL2R. In fact, that's itself is also very useful. Unitary, yes, unitary. Sorry, AI, thank you. I, I Germanized him for some reason. Uh, right, gave a complete classification of the unitary, unitary. Every, all, I always only care about unitary reduced representations, thanks. And so here, uh, so, so these, um, these MOS forms generate principal or, or complementary series representations, depending on if they're uh, principal series representations series yeah, what's going on here? series uh, representations um, or complementary you have to do something else for complementary series representations complementary well uh, to make it uh, so complementary series representations are not by themselves unitary but they're unitrizable you have to do something to uh, make it unitary whereas principal series representations are, are already uh, unitary as they are. And this decomposition is exactly the, comp the, the difference between lambda being less than a quarter, so strictly less than a quarter would be complementary series, or lambda greater than a quarter is the principal series, which are tempered, unlike the complementary series, which are not tempered. Tempered, Yeah, the, the matrix coefficients are almost in L2. They're in L2 plus epsilon for every epsilon. Um, the discrete series representations are in L2. In fact, uh, discrete series representations. Uh, again, I'm trying to uh, suppress. Uh, last time I tried to give you too much information, but I actually tried to give you the details. And so this time I'm, I think it, I'm thinking it would go better if I don't try to give any details, but maybe I'm. Maybe none of this is useful. I don't know. Okay. So, uh, so you, so what, what he, so Gilfand also through this gives a reinterpretation of Selberg's one quarter conjecture. It's that the only non-trivial representations that should arise in the decomposition of the automorphic dual. So you look at all the automorphic dual of SL two R's. You look at all congruence portions, and you try to understand what representations arise there. And uh, that should also be tempered. 
It should only be principal series. There should not be any complementary series representations arising for any congruence group. That's equivalent to Selberg's one quarter conjecture. It's the strongest form of uh, property tau, Lebowski property tau. Here is something you don't like. No, I don't to go. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm I'm obviously flying through through this material without giving any details. Um, yeah, so this was a really beautiful unification of, of these two things. But it gives you more than that. It gives you more than that because, um, in fact, I needed this at some point in uh, in one or more of my papers. Um, that because we have this classification, this gives us models. This gives uh, nice models for uh, such representations, such representations. So for example, let's say, um, let's say there's something, you know, these MOS forms, this, this MOS form is some bizarre summation with some coefficients and these Whitaker functions and e to the two pi i and x, like it's, it's often very difficult to, depending on what it is that you wanna uh, do with these things, it may be difficult to get your hands on some some structural property of this, uh, and but if you lift f to phi and you lift phi to v, and you know that this is some some irreducible representation, you know that phi but that f was an eigenfunction was a cusp form, uh, that tells you that this v phi is some principal or complementary series representation. Then you go to the the classification and you can find a model. So there exists. There exist nice models. If your question, if the question you want to ask about F is somehow functorial, it's something that that's really a question about the the representation space, and not and not about like the Fourier coefficients. Uh, there exist nice models in which to do calculations. In which to do calculations. Let me just give you one example. Example is the line model. The line model for a principal series representation is the following. You take V, let's call it Vs, to be the set of all functions on the real line now. These are just real valued, uh, complex valued, real, real argument, argumented functions with the following property. So I'll define an action pi ABCD of F evaluated X will be something like um, I can do CX plus D to the S. S is some complex number. S is a fixed complex parameter. Uh, F of AX plus B over CX plus D. And I want the space of all these things with uh, that are in L two, so uh, the integral of L squared is finite. It turns out that this will be an irreducible representation of G, and uh, you can check uh, for all f in uh, V S the Casimir operator again acts by scalars, and if I've set things up correctly, which I'm sure I haven't. Uh, that should be s times one minus s. Yeah. So this s should be the eigenvalue, as as always, should should correspond to the eigenvalue of the Casimir. So this is a very explicit model in which to to compute things. It's just real valued functions. It's not some functions on some big, uh, difficult to access space. Um, you can work this out from the induced representations. Should we talk about induction? <laughs> Uh, it's it's important. I'm trying to I'm trying to think of what are all the things you're going to see in in the later chapters that we haven't covered, so that at least uh, you've seen them once. It's it's something very simple. And we're going to lift this all to the Adels. Yes, yes. Let let me let me say this one last thing about the induced representation. So if I have a representation of of G, or let's do it when we have a character, because for SL two it's just going to be a character. We have we have uh, the Borel. The Borel is the uh, this subgroup. Uh, the whole point is a the zero there. This is called the Borel subgroup. Borel parabolic uh, subgroup of SL two R. 
Okay, so in other words, I have an A, A inverse. So this is A, A inverse and B and zero. Okay, and a character representation of this will be a, a character on A. So a uh, representation of B is a, is a function chi uh, that's, that takes A to A to some power. So that's the, A, A is basically R cross. What are the, uh, it's, it's one dimensional. What are the characters on, on one dimensional? On, uh, th this is exactly what we use for Mellon transforms, right? That A to the S is, is exactly what's happening here. And then the induced, the parabolic induction, the induced representation from the Borel to G is the space of functions on G, is the space of functions on G, so that um, when I take G and I put an A here, uh, so, so in general, if you have an H, if you have a representation on H, then uh, G times H, when I apply the regular, the H regular representation, so A is from, from here, um, I want this to be chi of A F of G. And in general, you'll take the representation uh, of, of this uh, subgroup and, and have it act on your vector. So, so that's what's going on here. That's exactly, the, and the line model is, okay, if that's, if that's what F does to all of G, well, I can write G in a coordinate system. I can write G uh, as like N bar uh, A N. This A N is in the Borel. So I know exactly what happens to, uh, uh, to, to this, this part. And the n bar is what I'm using as my real variable. I can also have a circle model. If I put a k a n, then, then I'll, instead of having a function on the reals, I'll have a function on the circle with a similar uh, property. And this, this turns out to be something like the character. OK, let's get to the Adels. <laughs> is this an utter failure? It might be an utter failure. Um, fine. Fine, fine, fine. What can I say? Okay, let's get to the Adels. So back to the Adels. Back to. Yeah, basically, once you realize that um, all of our differential operators, the, the um, Cauchy Riemann equation, the first order differential operator on holomorphic functions, and the Laplace operator are the same thing. It's just the, the core idea is irreducible representations of SL2R, you say, wait a second, where do HECA operators fit into this picture? HECA operators aren't seen by, by these operations as far as we can tell. That's when you introduce the Adelic picture. And now, and now the, uh, uh, everything is in one place. Back to uh, Adelic picture, Adels. So I have uh, GL2 of the Adels mod GL2Q. Of course, this is diagonally embedded. I keep uh, stressing the various embeddings. Um, and and for, for a finite volume quotient, this will be, so what's the, we, we proved the, um, uh, we proved a fundamental domain, proved a fundamental domain uh, for this is a domain for GL2R mod uh, GL2Z, which is not finite volume. Uh, the infinite embedding of this cross a product over all primes of SL2ZP. This is this compact bit, right? You remember we this was a strong approximation uh, theorem. Okay, so how are we going to lift? Um, no GL2. So so this is all yeah. Uh, this is GL2. There was a step at the beginning where we took out the. Um, oh, I said SL2. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, what comes out of my mouth is usually, I, my hand is smarter than, than my than my mouth. Somehow, inversely, inverse of the distance of the brain, is is what should be trusted. Um, you remember that uh, for recall. Uh, for GL1, GL1 of the Adels, uh, modulo GL1 of Q, of course, diagonally embedded. 
for that quotient, we had a way of lifting. It was a slightly complicated, convoluted way. Uh, we had we had a method to lift pi, a Dirichlet character, Dirichlet character, to omega, a Hecke character, which was an irreducible representation of GL1A invariant under GL1Q. So omega, which is a Hecke character. Right? It was slightly complicated. You you uh, you lift so if k if chi is a character mod p to the e, then uh, then we had this act by by different ways to make sure that it would be in the end invariant under GL one q. You you guys remember this discussion from a while ago? So um, so. It's very easy, in fact, to lift uh, a MOS form uh, of level one when there's no central character. Yeah, let, let's do that. Let's do that. So the lift, um, the lift of a MOS form is is completely trivial. Um, lift of a MOS form. F, F, F is on the upper half plane for, for SL2Z, say. So it has no central character, so we don't have to worry about uh, the, the local, the, the finite uh, primes. Lift of the MOS form for SL2Z to GL2 of the Adels is, is trivial. Is trivial. What you do is you make a function phi that takes an Adele, G infinity, G2, G3, in here. Actually, I don't even need, uh, I don't need to specify the components because what I'm, because I'm gonna cut it up in a second. So a G in here, what does this decomposition say? It means that any G in here can be written as this thing times something in GL2Q. Uh, any, for all G in GL2 of the Adels, there exists gamma in GL2Q and um, how do I want to say this? Um, what does this decomposition mean? If I have a G in here, then by acting on the right, on the left by an element of GL2Q, I can get into here. So uh, there exists a gamma in, in GL2Q and um, what should I call this G infinity in GL2R and GP in GL2ZP such that G is equal to this gamma diagonally embedded times uh, G infinity, G, G2, G3, and, uh, oh, uh, oh my God. This G is not, is not the same, let's call these H's. H, 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 maybe that's better. Okay, do you agree with this? So the existence, it's not unique because this is only unique up to GL2Z. Okay, so what's the lifting? You take, so this H infinity, it's an element in GL2R. Um, um, I can write H infinity as some uh, Y infinity, X infinity, zero, one, times some R infinity, R infinity, zero, zero. So it's, there's a center in GL2R, and then I can make it uh, upper triangular. And so phi of G, when you take such a representation, phi of G is just F of this X infinity plus I Y infinity. 
I can just forget everything else. If I'm on level one, I can forget everything else and just look at this one component. Now, why is this well-defined? This doesn't even look well-defined. The MOS form has invariance. This, this is only up to a choice of an element of GL2Z. And the MOS, that's exactly the invariance of the MOS form. Okay. So if I take, uh, sorry, I should also have a, a K infinity, K infinity here. If I take uh, an NAKZ decomposition for GL2R, I'm going to make it invariant under K. I'll take the X and Y, put it into the upper half plane, and get an adelic uh, function that way. Okay, if you had level and character, then you would have something more to say here because you would have to um, lift in a similar way what you'll see, uh, the treatment you'll see in, in the books is very similar to what we did in detail for lifting Dirichlet characters to Hecke characters is what you have to do at these other places. You can't just drop these other places. I mean, you have to do it at all places. But basically that's how, if you have uh, something with, uh, with a character, you can also lift. Uh, so when F is on, let's say gamma naught N with central character, with Nevin typus, with central character, character psi um, need to be more careful need to be careful with the lift and finally this is where um, we can see the action of HECA operators so just like uh, so you have this GK module, you have this GK module acting at the infinite place. You also have uh, GL2 of the finite adels acting, well, at, uh, at the finite places, at uh, finite places. And so what happens if you if you act by uh, act, say, by some uh, identity, 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 you get to the pth place and you act by p. On phi. And let's say phi is an eigenfunction uh, of this. So if you have one of these, if you have something that's irreducible under the action of the finite adels, not just the, the differential operators that we've been discussing at the infinite place. You also have something that's uh, invariant under the finite adels. When you sort out what this means, what this action is doing, uh, you have to, you have to re, uh, recast everything up here back into this fundamental form. It's exactly the heck operator. This, this is the heck operator. So um, irreduce in this way, so irreducible, uh, irreducible adelic representations capture not just, not just eigenfunctions, eigenfunctions of the Casimir as before, at infinity, as we already saw, they also capture all the heck operators simultaneously. They also capture all the heck operators in one fell swoop. So this is really beautiful. Now the heck operator is the same as the Casimir operator. Not just they commute. Why do they commute, by the way? They commute because Casimir is acting at infinity. The, the p-theca operator is acting in the p-th place. 
So one is uh, right regular representation. Well, the Casimir is a differential operator, but it's a differential operator that acts on the right by e to the tx differentiating with respect to t, taking t at zero. But that's only all happening at infinity, whereas this is all happening at p. So there's almost nothing to check. Um, all right. And then you can make L functions out of these things. Uh, you can define cuspidality. You can define L functions. I think I should just cut my losses and define L functions. Define L functions in a similar way. Study their study their uh, functional equations, functional equations, etc. The point is, this is a unified. This is a language that. Can I say it tells you more? I think I can say that it tells you more mathematically about, it's not just packaging. It's not just packaging. I would say right here is the most powerful thing about, uh, about it not just being packaging. These models. These models are something that, at least uh, in my experience, this, this has been the most powerful uh, use of uh, this representation theory stuff. It's not just cute packaging. Although it, it very much allows you to um, say things that would be very painful. Okay, once you get through the pain of uh, saying, uh, saying the words irreducible delic automorphic representations, um, it allows you to say, uh, to treat general level, general characters uh, on, on uh, general groups. I don't think we would get far beyond GL2 if we didn't, um, recognize what was going on representation theoretically. Um, who knows? Who knows how history would have developed? But um, it's it's a very convenient way to package things and it gives us more insights and it allows us to define. Yeah, so maybe, okay, so maybe one thing I can say in the last 10 minutes is uh, what happens in higher rank. I mean, <laughs> is he? He missed one? No. Uh, on for number three, seven, or eight, right? Ah, so he may as well have class. That's generous of him. Um, I, uh, no, I'm going to be actually busy on Tuesday. So I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it if I wanted to. Not that I don't want to. I also can't do it next Friday because I'm doing another makeup uh, next Friday. Let, let me stop. Let me stop. And um, we can just have an informal discussion if we like, or I can tell you about uh, GL3. Let, let's say we're done. Whoever wants to go can go. I can tell you one thing about what happens in slightly higher rank. Shall I tell you what happens in slightly higher rank? Yeah. Okay. Um, so what does this look like? What about, let's go back to the real setting. What about uh, GL3R mod GL3Z? We can work out uh, fundamental domains. Uh, fundamental domain is not too hard to work out. Domain in terms of um, Iwasawa coordinates. Um, so you can write uh, G in GL3R uh, can be written as some SO3, K in SO3, right? Three by three matrix that uh, preserves the quadratic form X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. Um, you uh, then can write N, A, K. So N, A, K. Uh, A, you can write instead of one Y, you can write one Y1, Y1, Y2. So that will, so now you have a two dimensional um, abelian. Uh, subgroup here. And then the N is uh, upper triangular unipotent X1, X2, X3. Okay, so this is a decomposition. And you can give like what we would say is, uh, well, X, X squared plus Y squared is at least one in the SL, in the two dimensional case, in the SL2 uh, case. Uh, X squared plus Y squared is at least one, and X is between minus a half a half, is a fundamental domain, right? This, this picture. 
Well, here we again can have some relations on the x's and y's. The x's can be placed between minus a half and a half. This group is now no longer abelian. It's nilpotent. It's still nilpotent. It's still uh, unipotent. It's still the exponential of a nilpotent thing. Um, and uh, so let's say you have a function uh, f on this quotient. I'll still write g mod gamma. G is now gl three f. How do you even get a Fourier expansion of this? This is not, this is not abelian. So what's a Fourier expansion? That's a functional equation, Fe Fourier expansion, oh, whatever. Well, this part of it is abelian. Right? Uh, I don't know how much we played with the Heisenberg group. Not much. Okay. Uh, if I take one x1, x2, x3, and I multiply it by one u1, u2, u3, what do I get? So I get ones down the diagonal. Uh, here I get an x1, u1 plus x3. Oops, u1 plus x1. Um, u1 plus x1, u1 plus x1, and nothing else. Okay. Yeah, by symmetry, u2 plus x2, and then u3 plus x1, u2. That's what I'm thinking. u3 plus x1, u2 plus x3, right? Okay, so look, it's almost abelian, x1 plus u1, x2 pl uh, plus u2, and x3 plus u3, and it has this extra thing here. So, um, so what you can do is you can take a, um, you can take the abelian transform in these variables, and then, uh, well, really, You, even the Fourier transform, even the Fourier expansion of F, to get to the Fourier expansion of F as a sum of something. So it's going to be a sum over N1 and N2. In fact, what you do is you Fourier expand these back uh, elements. And over here, you get a sum over SL2 or GL2Z. You, get a, you, uh, you Fourier expand in both of these coordinates. And then you get some coefficient, A depending on N1 and N2. And then you get some very complicated Whitaker function that Jacquet worked out for, for what the GL3 thing is. It'll be a function of the Ys, depending on the Ns and the gamma. And then you have characters uh, E, uh, N1, X1 plus N2, X2. And then to make the L function of F, it turns out it's the sum of A, N1 over n1 n1 comma 1 over n to the s this turns out to be the gl3 l function and it has a uh, third order euler product so p to the s 1 minus beta p p to the s 1 minus gamma p over p to the s Yeah, those are the co yeah, it, just like before. Just like before. The Whitaker function, yeah. So what what does it mean to be what's the analog of modular form? Or a MOS form? What's the analog of a MOS form? What's the Laplace in here? Well, you have the Lie algebra. So you look at the universal enveloping algebra and you look at the center. Yes, there are two Casimir operators. And you want f to be an eigenfunction of both of them simultaneously. And if it is, then there's this that that gen, there's a differential uh, equation that needs to be satisfied, and that's this Jacquet Whittaker function. Jacquet Whittaker function on the on the y's, and then we have this uh, thing with the x's. So 
yeah, that's what things start to look like in, in higher rank. This has a functional equation. Everything else goes, goes through. It's this uh, extra sum over GL2 that uh, causes many of the issues. But what, um, what uh, Jacquet Chalaika, maybe Godemont. So this is called the Godemont Jacquet, by the way. This is Godemont Jacquet standard L function. This is symmetric in N1 um, It's almost symmetric in N1 and N2. Not to like, if you were to do this for uh, some N2 comma one over N2 to the X, that would also be known something that you could utilize for the A. Uh, if I did if I did A one comma N2 uh, over N to the S, so that turns out to be the contragradient L function. Sure. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So L of the contragradient is uh, A one N2 over N2 to the S. That's what you're asking. Yeah. And so, so this is one of the issues. One of the issues is you only know the A and ones from the alphas and betas and gammas. But actually, the HECA algebra filled, tells you what all of them have to be. So, so this does determine these coefficients. And that's why, so uh, let me just write uh, Goteman Jacquet standard L function, standard L function, L function. And uh, what I said before was that the symmetric square lift, this was proved by um, Jacquet. Anyway, um, if you have a, a phi on uh, GL2, like a MOS ball, GL2 MOS, MOS ball, then you can cook up the symmetric square L function. Which uh, has a order th so this uh, this thing has uh, parameters alpha and beta. I think we discussed this. Uh, this was alpha squared over p to the s inverse one minus alpha beta, which is one, but and one minus beta squared. And um, this thing, uh, we do know the the lift of this. This uh, when you when you multiply all this out. You get some series, a n over n to the s. You take those coefficients, a n, you stick them into a Whittaker series like this. And this function will be an eigenfunction of all the operators because the Whittaker function's there. But it will also be invariant under all of GL3z. And that's, the, that's using the converse theorem. So the converse theorem, converse theorem implies a lift of this symmetric square phi to f on GL3, GL3. So there really is a way of taking these. This is what I meant by you take the Langland syntactic parameters, you make an L function out of them. You take those coefficients, use the HECA algebra to get coefficients a n1 and 2, stick them in a Jacquet Whitaker function, and that series will be an automorphic form and then automorphic representation on. GL3. So, um, so that's a lift that we do know. And then similar things. So as I, as I mentioned, symmetric fourth, symmetric fifth. Uh, 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 sorry, symmetric third, symmetric fourth are also known to be lifts to GL4 and GL5. This is the, that last uh, Shahidi and Kim Shahidi and Kim, which gives us the 764th spot. All right, let me put myself out of uh, our misery. <laughs>